A great part of the lecture will actually be about how to choose the different parameters of the tree. What's the effect of the tree's um, size? Um, if you're averaging trees, how many trees should you have in, in, in the forest? The forest is also known as an ensemble. So random forests are often known as ensemble methods. Another very popular class of ensemble methods is boosting. And, uh, and uh, I'm not going to cover boosting in this course, but uh, it's sort of very similar to random forest. So if you get random forest, you could very easily go in and um, understand the boosting algorithm. And then after looking at all these various choices that you have to make, um, then I'm going to talk about some applications. So in particular, how would you build a, a text classifier? How would you build a face detector on your phone? Um, or how would you build um, the, the type of classification technology that the Connect sensor of Microsoft uses? All right, so um, going back to Tuesday, the idea is that if we had 2D features that we wanted to classify, so we have points in 2D indicated by those coordinates x1, x2, um, and some of those points are labeled, so they have a class label. In this case, there are four um, classes, yellow, green, red, and blue. Um, the idea is whenever a new point, V, starts at the root of the tree, um, so initially, in, um, as in this picture, there's equal amounts of red and yellow and green. So at the root, the root of the tree would involve that whole space where all the points are. And so in that space, each color has the same proportion. So we have this histogram here that just says how likely, if you are to look if you are to look in this area, which happens to be the root of the tree, how likely is the new point V to be green, blue, red, or um, what was the other one? The other color. And the, the probability of a, a point in this space being of any of these four colors is just one over four. Okay, and so that's what this distribution here, the probability of the class given V is. And C is just one of the four classes. One, two, three, four. Or if you wish, call them red, green, blue, and yellow. And so as we build the tree, we come up with nodes that split the space. So when we do a split like this, for example, um, maybe the, the yellow, yellow, blue, and reds will go this way and then the green points will go this other way. So a split um, of the points in 2D that is just using a line and just asking yourself a question, is x1 greater than, um, let's call this value 1.6, and so the question in this node would simply be, is x1 greater than 1.6. And of course, V has two coordinates. Every point <coughs> has a coordinate x1 and a coordinate x2. So essentially, you pick the first coordinate of the point, of any point that you're given, a point V, arbitrary point V, and you check, is the first coordinate greater than 1.6 or less than 1.6? If it's greater, you send it to the right. If it's less, you send it to the left. Okay. We build the trees during the training set, and we went over in the, uh, how to do this in the last class. We, what we tried to do was to come up with, and building a tree essentially involves choosing those numbers, those thresholds. And the way we built that was by starting with many thresholds and then picking the one that gives us, um, so starting with a large finite set of thresholds, and then picking out of them one that is the one that maximizes information gain. So for each threshold, we compute information gain. 
the one that gives us the largest information gain. That's the threshold we split and that becomes the node. The node simply checks if the first coordinate is greater than um, 1.6. And then we do the same for the second coordinate. And if you do that, when you construct the trees, you will get um, a separation of the classes as you go down the leaves. So when you get a new point coming in, that point just follows these simple tests. Is the first coordinate greater than 1.6? Is the second coordinate less than 0.2? And so on. As, and as it trickles down the tree, it will end up in a leaf. And then the class probabilities for that new point V is just the distribution at the leaf. So if a point ended up here, for example, at that leaf of the tree, then most likely that point is red. Okay, because all the trading points that ended up there tended to be red. Okay, so that's just how we construct a single tree and how we use a single tree. And, um, and as I said, you could either do splits vertically or horizontal splits. Um, here is an example with two splits resulting in these two different class distributions for the children. And then you pick the one split that has the highest information gain. So in this case, the information gain for the split at the bottom is higher. So we choose the, the split at the bottom. And it sort of makes sense because the one at the bottom has separated um, has allowed us to distinguish things that are yellow and red from things that are um, blue and green. So it separated us two. So hopefully the next node down the line will be able to separate green from blue and yellow from red. Okay. So doing this with a very simple example, um, this is how we would proceed. Let's assume that we're trying to do classification. And let's assume that we have our data, X, a matrix X. And let's say that matrix consists of D equals three features and N equal four points. Or actually, let's just pick five, five data. So we would have some arbitrary numbers, I don't know, 1, 0, 2, 3, 6, 1, 0, 2, 4, 8, 9, 0, and I don't know, 5, 5, 1. Okay. So these are points in 3D. Five points in 3D. And to this, um, and so this is for i equal 1, i equal 2, all the way i to i equal n equal 5. And then I'm going to use the index j of a feature. j equal 1, j equal 2, j equal 3. So this could be for a particular individual. Let's assume I have five individuals. So let's assume that I have these three guys here and these two guys. So I have five individuals. And for each of these five individuals, I've recorded three properties of them. Their height, their weight, the intensity of green in their eyes. And then I have another label, another vector, because we're in the supervised case. So we have now a classification label. And that might be something that says, um, I don't know, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Okay, and that would be for i equal 1, i equal 2, all the way up to y equal 5. Okay, so the y's are the labels. So I have an individual here. There's three numbers that describe him, 1, 0, and 2. And then I also know that he's of class zero, whatever class zero means, male or female, for example. Now, that's the data that we are given, the input-output pairs. And um, what we typically do when we build a random tree, so I'm trying to go down, I'm basically repeating how we build a tree, but using a very simple example. 
So how we build a tree is, and especially if we want to inject randomness in the tree, and I will soon explain why we would want to do this, uh, in, in, um, induce randomness, we could do something as follows. We could say pick two features at random. If I pick two features at random, um, let us say that I pick features x when j equal 3 and x when j equal 1. So I picked the first row and the second row. So if, um, I've picked the intensity of green in their eyes and their height. I've by at random decided not to include their weight. Now, in doing this, I now have points, right, in 2D, because I have two features, so it's 2D plane. And those points, basically, uh, this would be one point, the point one comma two. And I haven't been careful in how to choose these particular numbers, the numbers that I'm throwing in there, they don't really matter. They're just, I just wanted to illustrate that those would be numbers. Your data usually is numeric. And so I can plot that point there, the point 1, 2, say, and then I can plot the point 3, 1, and I can plot the other point and uh, and I'm going to choose say this point and this point as the other point. Okay, so essentially what I'm using here is I'm doing a color coding that if the label is blue, if the label is one I'm using the color blue, if the label is zero I'm using the color red. And because there are points in 2D, there would be just five dots, and I would have two red, three red dots corresponding to the class zero, and two blue dots corresponding to the class one. Okay, so that gives me, that's essentially how I would construct a node of the tree. So the first step is I pick, say, two dimensions. In this case, I'm choosing two, um, but I could equally well, um, at random, decide how many dimensions I will choose. So I could choose, um, typically, D in real data is much larger than, say, in this example where we only have three features. If you're doing text classification, for example, your D could be 100,000. And then our task is to reduce that huge D-dimensional vector in 100,000 dimensional space to a much smaller set of points in order to make decisions. Now, the next step I'm going to do is somewhat different depending on the implementation of a random forest, um, but nonetheless it's uh, the one that I've chosen as a popular one. What folks do is they consider the projections of these points on each axis. Okay, so there will be the projections on the x-axis the projections on the y-axis, which is essentially x1. Okay. And now those are the split points. So this obviates the need for us to come up with split points, to a set of split points, because now we, our split, split points are just these five um, x points and five y points. So there's a total of ten split points. In other words, we're just using the coordinates of the points as the split points. Now, there are a total of 10 split points in this case. So there are 10 possible lines that I could use to split this node into two ch children. Um, the way I do it is 
I, for each split point I evaluate the information gain just using the formula of entropy. I then choose the split point that has the highest information gain and if there is a tie I just break ties random. Okay, so for each of these green lines I would have to compute the information gain of what would happen if we split the data on the point. If I do that most likely I will end up with a split point that say looks like this. So suppose I pick that point and I decide to split the node on that point because that point seems to have high information gain. Then what that means is that in my tree is doing the following thing. points here. All right, and we need the blue points as well. So let's draw them so we have here and then here we will add them here. Okay, so the purple line essentially creates two children. The points to the right, in, including the point on the boundary, you just need to make a choice as to whether the boundary goes left or right and be consistent. Um, the points on the right become the, the right child, the points on the left become the left child. Okay, so we started, um, uh, we started with a distribution here. We, we started with a distribution that had two out of five blue points and three out of five uh, red and now we have a distribution that here that has um, two out of three uh, blues and one out of three red points and over here it's very nice because over here we have uh, just red points with probability one. Okay, so that's how we go about constructing a tree. And we inject randomness um, for two reasons. Um, the first reason is because if you just, if D is very large, in this case three is not a problem. But suppose that D had been a uh, hundred thousand. Then if for, all, for each of those hundred thousand points, a hundred thousand dimensions, you had a thousand points, that's how many information gains you would have had to evaluate. So the computation would have been uh, very large. But by choosing a subset at random, we now only need to evaluate uh, the split point for just a few points. So I'm going to take one, two, three. I was wondering when choosing the split line on a particular dimension, is there a reason that you have to evaluate at each of these points as opposed to having it like an optimization problem where you're trying to choose the uh, position on this axis that gives you the greatest information gain. Like, I'm wondering uh, you that's in fact evaluating at all points is, is uh, the same as optimizing for that. It's, we're doing the optimization problem by enumeration because the the idea is that we've chosen just a few of these points. In this case, there's only ten splits, so some enumerating ten splits is something that we can do very fast. But wondering. if you wanted to use more splits, then you would have to use some smarter discrete optimization algorithm. I was wondering whether it would be possible to avoid having to do evaluations at every point. Like, for example, if there is a closed form formulation that would give you what uh, value on the axis would give no, you the information. No, the, there isn't in this case. W what you could do is you could use more dimensions and you could just run um, you know, one of these stochastic local search algorithms, for example, and you could do some something greedy. That wouldn't be guaranteed to find the best split. But since we're injecting randomness, that might not be such a bad thing. I do not know what would happen. I haven't tried that or don't know of any papers that have tried that, but this is something you could experiment with. Um, how do you choose um, 
the random features? So you just pick any features? Say uniformly at random. For now we will assume that we're doing uniformly at random. Maybe there's room to do something smart. But then does that guarantee that you would, so I'd say you have data that's really noisy and only a few features are actually what changed, but are you guaranteed that you're going to get them? Aha, uh -huh. that's the, the, the key question. If we're building a single random tree and there were 100,000 and we're only picking two and we repeat this, op in this operation then this is how we're learning a node and then for the children I would just repeat the same operation again. I would pick features at random, I would split, compute information gain, etc, etc. Uh, but of course, like if you start playing a bit with probability you realize well I'm choosing two or ten out of a hundred thousand, <coughs> I keep doing that per node, what are the chances that I'm actually going to hit on the important features? And a single random tree by itself turns up to not be a very good classifier. But when we combine, when we take many trees together, we will get very powerful classifiers. So that's what's going to be in the next slide. Um, you just answered my question. Okay, and so here comes the random forest. In short, what the random forest will do is we will construct a tree um, randomly like we've just done and we could construct a tree in one machine, a tree in a different machine and so on. So it's a completely distributed algorithm. Um, is there any f features you gain from randomness or it's just for complexity? Oh um, yes, I didn't get to the second point. Indeed, the first point is you, um, you reduce uh, computation time um, the second one is uh, randomness will actually turn out to be useful. Sorry? Randomness will turn out to be useful. And let me try to illustrate that with some example. Um, I will provide you with an intuition. But let me first cover the algorithm and then I will tell you why it is that the algorithm makes sense and why randomness is a good thing. Okay, so the algorithm is essentially you take trees and you sum them and divide by the number of trees. Okay, so how exactly do we do that? Um, the algorithm has two sources of randomness. One is randomness in the data and the other one is randomness in the, in the splits and the features. Let's analyze it um, step by step. Let B denote a single tree. Okay, so one simple tree. And we're going to build a forest that has capital B trees. Okay. Then next, this is how we build each tree. We have a data set of n points. Okay, so we have um, our data set which is x1, y1, all the way to x, n, y, n. Okay, just like in a simple example before. Now, in order to create even more randomness, we're going to assume that each tree gets to see a different set of, a different data set. So, what we do is we take our n data and with replacement, we draw uniformly at random n data. Okay, that means that some point might be picked twice and other points might never be picked. Okay. Now, I chose this version of the algorithm uh, from the book that's on the website, uh, the book of the elements of statistical learning, um, that has a very nice section describing random for a very nice chapter describing random forests. And this is the version that uh, Leo Bryman who is the person who proposed random forests about 10 years ago, um, came up with. This step is called bootstrapping, or it's also um, related to something called bagging. And I will soon explain what bagging means. 
But the idea of drawing at random data sets and then using different data sets to train different classifiers is something that's called bootstrapping. And it's a technique that is used often to assess how good, uh, what's the confidence that I've had uh, estimated good parameters. So it's a way of doing complexity control and statisticians often use it as an alternative to cross validation. So the idea is you draw data points at random, you train on those and then you test on the remaining ones. And you repeat this many times and then you average your re results and that gives you sort of an estimate of how well, uh, whether you have the right model, the right parameters. It gives you a confidence of how well you're doing. Um, so sometimes when you estimate a parameter from data and you want to know were 10 data points good enough to estimate this parameter? How good is my confidence on this estimate? You would do this technique called bootstrapping. I, I'm not going to go into this uh, model uh, evaluation technique, so I'm not going to touch on it. Um, if the technique is used simply for combining many estimators, and for example here we're combining many trees, this process is called bagging. So bagging just means you construct each tree on a different random subset of the data. Okay. Now, Leo liked the idea of, because of the connection with bootstrapping and being able to get unbiased systematics, etc., big story, he liked the idea of choosing n data points. That is, re re choosing n data points from a data set of n points. <coughs> However, uh, for computational efficiency, um, it, we might want to choose less than n points. It would be great if we could use, say for example, just choose square root n of the points. And then each tree gets only trained on a subset of the data. Okay, that in today's world where data sets are so large, you can't just load the data into memory. Okay, for go and work for a company, Google, you're not going to load your data to memory. That's not going to happen. So what you can do is split the data and you can load the data into different machines. Okay, chunks of data go into different machines. Even if you're using solid state RAM and the, the latest, um, you're going to have to do something smart to load uh, when you have a lot of data. If you loaded a subset of the data in a different machine, now you can learn a tree on each of these machines in a cluster and each machine only sees, say, square root n of the data points. And without proof, there is a theoretical result uh, by Luc de Vroy and a few and colleagues that says that if you, in fact, uh, do this sort of thing, um, you're guaranteed to have an estimator that is consistent, just like maximum likelihood. In other words, as your number of data goes to infinity, you have something that's provably convergent. Moreover, there are some estimators, which I haven't covered in this course, like the one year's neighbor um, classifier, that actually by themselves are inconsistent. They, in the limit, as the number of data goes to infinity, they don't give you the right answer. But if you were to distribute the n data points across square root n machines, and you do this averaging, then that estimator is actually consistent. Which is a remarkable result because something that gives you the opportunity to actually be able to compute also gives you something that is statistically correct. Um, free lunch theorems like these don't come often in, in science. It's, it's a very cool result. So, um, um, yeah, random forests are awesome for many reasons. This is one of the reasons. So, the, aver the idea of averaging estimators is simply what we call bagging. In this case, we are, the ter ter terminology would be that we are bagging trees. But you could bag other estimators. And why bag trees and not bag other things? That's something that I'm going to come to when we talk about randomness. Uh, what, what are you averaging yeah, exactly? Oh, um, so what I'm averaging, let me try to give you a picture. Okay. Suppose I have three trees in my ensemble my forest. Um, for, and let's assume that I use the same, so I have tree one, tree two, three, three. Now the same point 
Now each tree is different. Each tree was constructed on a different data set. Moreover, each tree, when you build the nodes, we follow the procedure that I outlined a few minutes ago, where we use, we, at random, we choose the features. With that being the case, if you're doing things at random, H3 will be different because it has seen different data and it has seen different features. So when you get a point in the test data, say you get a new point V, for which you don't know the label, you don't know whether it's a red, green, blue or yellow point, you just f follow that, that point goes in the tree and follows the decisions. Is it greater than a value or not, if it's less it goes left and, and so on. For a different tree the node will follow a different route. <coughs> now each tree eventually when it gets at a leaf, these are the class probabilities for that um, for that point V. So under the first tree that point is most likely to be green. But it could be a little bit red or a little bit blue. Under the second tree, the second tree is very confident that the point, the same point, V, is green and the last tree is sort of less committal. Averaging just means you take these four histograms, which is four vectors of four entries that add up to one and you sum the three of them and you divide by three at three vectors divided by three. That's what I mean by average. So that the histogram P of C, which is the probability of each color, C is the color, um, and there are four colors. So this is a distribution defined over four values, which is essentially the histogram that's being shown there in the picture. Um, it's just the sum of the individual histograms. Go ahead. This averaging is done at the bottom of the tree? That is correct. So if it's such a powerful uh, result, why not making it also you know, during the branches, the node of the tree? So depends on depends on how you're deploying this. If you, I mean, you might want to make a decision before reaching the leaves. Um, and you might want to do intermediate decisions. And you could completely do that. There is no reason stopping you to do averaging at any of the nodes. You could make, trying to, it's an any time algorithm as such. So you could make decisions just like the root node or the next node, or you could make decisions after a certain amount of time has elapsed. But because um, well, each tree is randomly constructed and different, so there's no notion of the same node, the same material in each tree. Is that is correct. In the average that is correct. So you, all you would do would be, you could averaging in the sense that if you have, if for a tree, five minutes have elapsed, you check where that point is in the decision. And it's that cell that determines the, the histogram for that point. And so you could do it again for each tree and then averaging would make sense. So here we're using depth as the decision to do it to average, but you could use time or some other factor. If you have a thousand trees and a thousand probabilities, is the mean always the best way to combine those? Uh, no. So the mean is one way to do it. Um, another way the, to do it is to take, uh, the, I mean there's the arithmetic mean. Some people like to use the geometric mean. When we, when we get into dropout nets, which is a form of bagging later in the course, um, you'll see that I will make arguments for using the geometric mean instead of the arithmetic mean. And then, pardon? Uh, trimming outliers, say, like, um, or, you know, if, uh, or I, I don't know, other things like that. Yeah, yeah like using, say, point. the median or whatever. Yeah. You might want to do that. I, I don't know what the effect of doing that or uh, can't think of an example where people do that, but I can imagine that the, there's a whole, um, other aspect to this is how to combine, which, which is the average. And, this, in, and it's something definitely worth thinking about. Because combining probabilities in general, like if you have a thousand probability, you know, yes. the same probability, how do you combine And so this paper of um, 
that I'm using for this, which is the one that I've made available to you guys in the Google group, is by Antonio Cremonisi. It's actually a book. It's a short booklet. Um, he actually considers, he talks about a bit about this. So for example, he even suggests that averaging might not be the one thing what you want to do. What you want to do is just take the product. So it, in other words, take the, the conjunction as opposed to the disjunction. Which is a like of yeah. That's correct. And, and that might be interesting in some cases to do that. And that often will depend on what is your problem, what is your data, and what, what, what things about the data are important to you. But by and large, I think the averages, the arithmetic averages, the one that if you download code will be the default. Okay, let's go back to how we construct a tree. So we said each tree will only see a subset of the data. And then the rest is essentially the next three steps, which are outlined here, is essentially the three steps that I described when I constructed that very simple example. We select m variables. Um, so here they're using the variable p to indicate the total number of features. And this is saying just choose a subset of the features. We choose a subset of size m of the features. Uh, we then choose a split point and then whatever the best split point is, we use that split point to split the node into two daughter nodes, two children. And then the output of the algorithm is just all the trees. And once you have the output of the algorithm, we're going to combine the trees by simply averaging. Now one detail, just to, for completeness, is that um, if all the parameters of the tree is given by theta, that is this would be all the possible thresholds for the data set, then each node only has access to a subset of those thresholds. Okay, so that's clear. We, we chose a subset of the features and so hence there's only a subset of the thresholds. And then the decision that's made to choose the best threshold is to just maximize the information gain, as before. Okay. So that equation is just basically saying what I said with this picture, which is consider all the lines, all the green lines, and then pick the one that best splits the point. And the way we define best split of points is by computing information gain. Okay, so that leaves us with an ensemble, and I will claim, and, you know, and ensembles work extremely well. So the question is, why do they work so well? And I cannot go into the theory, uh, but it has a lot to do with the one one simple way to think of it is in, um, in terms of the bias variance dilemma that I ask you to look at in your homework. Um, trees are very, by using randomness in particular are extremely high variance classifiers. Uh, so each tree is a very high variance classifier because you just perturb the randomness in one node or which features you get or perturb which square root n data points you choose and you would get a completely different decision. So a very different decision. They are correct. Each tree is correct except that each tree is only seen a little bit of the data and a little bit of the features. So they are correct, but they're missing a lot of information. And as a result, so you can think of formalizing this, they're, we're eliminating the bias by using very simple decision. But we're introducing variance because each tree is very different from the other trees. So there's high variance among these trees. Now, let us also assume that because of this discrete structure of the tree, so using thresholds, that these trees are not very much correlated with each other. So then the argument of why trees work well is sort of as follows. And I'm only going to give this argument with a, a picture without going into the details. Suppose you're doing regression you have y, and it's easier to make the argument in the regression context. Suppose that you have a true value of y, 
and let's say that the true value of y is just that horizontal line. Now, I haven't told you how to use trees to do regression, but I will come to it soon. But let's assume that I use trees to do regression. Then one tree, because it's only seen a little bit of the data, might come up with a regression function that will look like this. Okay. So its bias is very low, but it's very high variance. Okay. It's oscillating about the truth. Now, we pick another tree. And that tree only sees a subset of the points. Okay, assuming that this thing was built, maybe this was the data that gave rise to this. So this is sort of a regression problem. Those were my green points and I fit the line there. Of course, I'm not fitting a line, but imagine that I'm fitting, say, some RBFs. Now, let's consider the fit of another tree. Another tree might go like this. Okay. So a different function will do a different fit. Now what happens if I average these? In this case, where I carefully drew them so they would be sort of anti-correlated, if I average them I get the truth of something very close to the truth, with the black line. So if you have many estimators that have wide oscillation about the truth, they have high variance, but they are unbiased, and you average them, and provided they are not correlated, because if they were correlated, they would all be similar lines, similar curves. And so when I average them, I'm not going to get something like the black line. But if they are uncorrelated, so if they're very different lines, when I average them, Averaging will get rid of the variance. Okay, so if you sum blue plus red, divide by two, you would get something close to the black line. That's the intuition why trees work. We, use, we bag trees because trees tend to be very different from each other. So that sort of guarantees that they'll be uncorrelated. A lot of machine learning techniques um, do tend to give you the same solution no matter which bit of data you look at and no matter which features you use. So those would not be good for bagging because those would be very correlated. When you average them, you wouldn't change, things wouldn't change much. Um, for those of you who did 340, things like logistic regression, for example, wouldn't be very good. But trees, because they tend to be very uh, highly random and tend to be very different from each other, are excellent for this. So when you average them, you uh, get them. If you look at Leo Breiman's paper, this is essentially the argument that he gives for why random forests work. Um, the developing a theory of why random forests are, are consistent is a much harder endeavor. For some types of random forests, there are results. For the general random forest algorithm, the result is still open. <coughs> All right, so. I'm going to look at an example now, and um, the first example that we look at is how we build a text classifier. Now, for a text classifier, you have words. Suppose you wanted to build a news detector, something that goes on the web and detects whether an article is news. Um, so then it would look at terms that might indicate that it's uh, a news article, like breaking story and so on. Or an even much simpler example. Uh, assume you want to build a spam detect. A spam, you know, message comes into your folder. It has words, so the words are the features. And you just basically check which words are present, and you use the presence of um, different words to decide whether um, the message is spam or not spam. For example, if the word Viagra is, is in your message, much more likely that it is spam than not spam if you happen to not consume Viagra, that is. OK, so essentially, we have a dictionary of words, which include words like Viagra, um, CS, um, homework, 
Um, I don't know what else, dog, etc. So we have a large vocabulary of words and that vocabulary is well as large as English terms. Wikipedia there's 2,000 pages so there's sorry 2 million, there's about 2 million terms. Of course there are way more terms than just those 2 million. Um, so this could be something as high as 2 million terms uh, typically. So you have those 2 million terms in that list and what we're going to do is we're going to uh, uniformly at random choose 100. So we take a subset of these at random, not necessarily continue uh, one after the other. And now once you choose that subset at random and we're going to assume as well that when we're constructing this random forest that we have labels. Yet again we're still doing supervised learning. So you have a message and a label indicating whether it's spam or not spam. Okay. So now you take a message. So, so you have a subset of features that you're looking at, say 50 features out of the 2 million features. Um, there comes a new message. Okay. And that message also has a plus one indicating that it's spam. So that's your email basically. All these words, whatever. Now what you do then is for each of these 50 words, you check whether the word is present or not present in that email. And let's assume that we don't have just one email but we actually have now a database of emails. Which some of which are spam, some of which are not spam. You take each of these terms, you check their presence in each of these emails. So for example, this green term might appear in this email. This might be the word Viagra. Uh, no, it wouldn't appear there then. but it would say appear there. So this particular green term is splitting your documents into two sets. So if you check is green present, by checking whether green is present, you're splitting your collection of documents into two documents that are negative, or oh sorry, uh, negative in the sense that they are positive, they're spam. And one document that has label minus one. Now, when you choose, I chose the green one, but because you have 50, what you would do is for each of those 50 words, you would check presence in the documents. And for each of those 50 words, you would compute information gain. A word is a feature, and a word is just like an attribute. Just like the attributes that we had before, like patterns. Are there patterns in sight? Or is, is today Friday? A word is just a discrete binary feature. Is the word Viagra in the document? Yes, no, that splits the, the training data nicely. And so by doing that, we split the training data. We construct a tree. We do this many times to build many trees. And then we average these trees, and that's what we use as a text classifier. If you do that, you can build an extremely good text classifier. You can classify the entire web, for example, into categories. It will be that computationally feasible. Is the same subset of features within each tree, or is it different at each node of the tree? Uh, different at each node of the tree. And th but that's also design choice. Some people like to do randomize the set of features at each node. Um, some folks like to just start a completely different set. Sorry, just keep the same set. Do we need to make sure that all of those feature words has to be within all within the subset of trees? Pardon? Like 
uh, do you need to make sure that all of those feature words has to be present in the collection of subsets? Like that one each subset that we use for each tree. Do you need to make sure that the collection of up to subsets would make the whole uh, collection of the um, uh, feature? I, so I wasn't able to follow. Do you need to make sure that the sub? So let, let's be concrete. The subset of features are you talking about? The vector on the left, the vector of 50. Yeah, so if we accumulate all those 50 feature uh, okay. words, that would accumulate to the whole list of those million feature words. Oh, you mean you want to use all the 2 billion? Um, excellent question, sir. I didn't understand it, but, uh, but it actually is an excellent question. Um, and the beauty is that no. There are many words you, you will not need to consider. Of course, you could miss an important word, like the word Viagra. Um, but the way you would do it is you would probably construct the list of words there based on the frequency of occurrence of those words in emails. Okay, or the frequency of occurrence of those. Words. So English has the, this property that some words are used a lot and many words are used very rarely like loquacious and so on. So you probably would not pick loquacious. So if you do that, now you have some words you would pick with higher probability than others. So you wouldn't do things uniformly at random, but you might choose to choose some words with higher probability. So some features are more important than others. But in addition, when you pick, after you've picked 50 at random, you're only going to choose one of those 50. Okay? And you might put some um, some flag in your code that says you've already used that word, you don't want to use it again. Okay, so you would sample that word again after you've used it in a note. 49 of those 50 will be rejected. They will not be good words that you will use. So at the end of the day, the number of words that is deciding whether this message is spam or not is the number of nodes in the tree. So although originally we had a very large number of features, two million features, now we have learned that if you want to decide whether something is spam or not spam, we only need, say, uh, 20 features if the tree has 20 nodes. In other words, we not only built a classifier, but we built a system that actually tells us which 20 features are important out of the two million. So we've been able to do feature selection. If you're doing DNA microarray classification and you'd have 20,000 genes, this would tell us which 50 genes we should be paying attention to when we're trying to predict whether a patient, a patient will react well to a treatment or not to react well to that tree. Now, for a single tree, again, this might give you a crummy estimate because there's a lot of variance here. This is a lot of randomness. But when you average many trees, you will get a pretty good estimate of that. And so what you do is you, if each tree gives you 20 words, you just count those words in all the trees, you check how many times the same word appeared across all the trees, and then you get a chart which basically tells you the importance of each word when you separate spam versus non-spam. And there's a beautiful, I don't have a slide for it, but it's in the book in the textbook that's available online on the course website, the book of the Elements of Statistical Learning. Um, in their chapter, Random Forest, they actually have such a plot like that, where for spam classification, they show you bars indicating the importance of each word. So not surprisingly, words like offer and Viagra and so on, they will have a high probability. So trees are great. Uh, Red and Force are great for this, that even though the feature sets are massive, they will be able to identify a subset of those features in a reasonable, reasonable amount of time and be able to do classification. Okay? So I've worked with teams who've actually um, classified 100 million text documents into many classes. The numbers of features were thousands of features. And those teams were able to do this, uh, you know, within a couple of days. Um, there was one there. 
Uh, yeah, coming back to my, uh, to my previous question regarding the, um, the benefit of randomness. So, um, in trees, uh, we decide according to the measure of entropy. So, if you do this uh, randomness, does it help you in the sense? To, instead of uh, taking the whole... Oh, instead of using the... You do need to somehow have... Um, so, some, yeah. so, yes, it helps. So some people do do this completely at random, without taking into consideration the class label. And those are called, I think the terminology is pure random forest, as in purely random. They don't do as well in practice. And again, information gain is one thing people use. People also use variants, they use Gini indices, they use many other things. So, so I'm giving you one version of the tr how to build a random forest, but depending on the implementation out there, there'll be different. Uh, you know, there's, if you change here and there, it's a very modular thing. So there's probably, I don't know, 50 versions out there or so. My, my question was regarding comparison of the random tree to the, taking the whole set of data and making uh, the decision the way we learned on Tuesday. Uh, pardon? So comparing the random uh, tree, um, the random forest, I guess, to what we learned on Tuesday, which is to take the entire set of data and divide it to a single tree. Oh, a single tree and the whole data versus just using a forest. Right. So the forest will work better in practice. Trees are still very high variance, even if you're going to use them on the large data. The trees could be made to be consistent. I mean, as n goes to infinity, you could make both trees and forests be consistent, give you the same answer. Um, forests tend to be a lot better in practice. And oh, again, do not forget the argument I made before, which is if you have a one nearest neighbor classifier, a single nearest neighbor classifier with an infinite number of data will not give you the right answer. But if you just give square root n data to several one nearest neighbor classifiers um, and the right growth rates for the number of trees and the data, you will get a consistent estimator. So it's possible to make a consistent estimator out of a non-consistent estimator just by using bagging. So that's, again, a very powerful theorem. So you said that in, in random forest, uh, by doing this randomization and picking a subset, you sort of start figuring out which features are more important towards the outcome. How does this compare to something like you know, a, a regular like Lasso, which will take away the Good question. So um, most of the class hasn't looked at Lasso. So, uh, but there's this other optimization approaches that we will come to later in the course that allow you to select features, to d decide which features are important. I mean, that you can imagine is an extremely important problem in, in, in everything that you're doing with machine learning is which genes are important? Because once you know which genes are important, you know which genes you should treat. These are the genes that are responsible for the patient having cancer or not cancer. Therefore, when we do research, these are the genes that we should experiment with, as opposed to be experimenting with the whole genome. Um, and, you know, many more applications. Um, one of the nice things about using trees for feature selection is that they're very scalable. If you are doing lasso with two million words as input, that will be a huge coordinate optimization problem. So trees construct the features um, adding one at a time, so to speak. You add one node, then you add one another node, and so on. Whereas methods that go in batch, they start with all the features, and then they try to prune. But they might be more computationally expensive. So they tend to give the same answer? Or the same? Not necessarily. <laughs> um, there was another one there. Uh, training set, how do you choose the training set? In the beginning you said it's uniform, and when you had only one tree, now do you choose it at random, the training set? Uh, sorry, could you please speak up? The, the training set, do you choose it at random? The training set, yeah. yes. The training set is to be random, because you're drawing it sets at random. For frequentists, data is the random quantity, remember that. For a frequentist, the data is where the randomness is, arises. Because for a frequentist, um, uncertainty only exists because you haven't seen an infinite number of data. 
It's because of partial observability of the world that uncertainty arises. Um, in the Bayesian setting that is also true, but in addition there is uncertainty in the parameters. So people acknowledge that there is priors of the models and so on. But yeah, the randomness is always in the data. I mean, in everything we've done in maximum like this, always the assumption was that the randomness was induced by the data. So I'm wondering if you're doing this for a All right, so I'm going to come to that example. Any more questions? Th that's correct. We, we're still assuming independent data. We're not dealing with uh, a time evolving system or so. It's possible to use random forest for tracking and so on, but uh, tracking distributions, but that's not what I'm covering here. I'm doing something basic first so that we assume that the data is independent and then if you're interested in doing more complicated things then come to office hours after this lecture and I'll point you in the right. What, you, uh, what we should do uh, during the test process if the probability of for example being read is uh, about 0.9 uh, mm -hmm. at a specific node which is different from uh, which is not the, uh, which is different from the terminal node is not the terminal node. Okay, you guys seem to be focusing too much on this of not reaching the terminal node. Um, so we, we don't need, uh, I mean. You don't need to reach the terminal node. So if you stop at the node before, then just use whatever the probabilities are there. Um, but if you have, a, you built, obviously you built more nodes because there, you believe that there was a reason to build more nodes. So if you did believe build more nodes, and you did some complexity control where you chose the height, the level of the tree to maximize, say, cross validation performance, then it stands to reason to just follow the path to the leaves. That's what you would typically do in practice. Yes. Okay. So I won't get to the examples today. I think you guys are all asking some brilliant questions. Um, that will be. Um, uh, after the spring break, I, I will finish this lecture. Um, and I will be just going over the applications. And in fact, it won't be me, it will be one of my, uh, one of my grad students who will finish this lecture for me. Um, but let's just look at the various parameters in this construction of the tree. So first of all, how many trees should we average? And so here is an example from the, the book of Criminis and colleagues where these are the training points here. So you have a cluster of points here and a cluster of points here. And then next, um, they show you uh, two trees. And these trees are often called stumps. Because they're just like a tree stump, it's just a very simple shallow tree. That is a tree that just splits the data set into two groups. And there's one tree that does a a horizontal split and here's another tree that does a vertical split. Now if you only used one tree, this is the class, so one tree, this is the kind of classification you would get. If you use eight trees, you start getting a more interesting decision boundary. And here the intensity of red is how much you are of one class, say class one, and the intensity of yellow is how much you are of class um, two. And then as the number of trees keeps increasing, as you go to 200, then you get this sort of smoother separation. Okay, so more trees give you better decision boundaries in this case. It'll give you smoother decision boundaries. Of course, we're estimating probability, so you could think of this, in fact, as the contours of a probability distribution. You could even fit, fit two Gaussians to these points and that would give you a very nice model of the two classes. Um, another thing that um, is worth keeping in mind is that in this construction it doesn't matter whether the labels are binary or whether there's three labels or five labels or ten labels. The number of labels doesn't matter. Trees work well independent of the number of classes. So for example, here is an example where there's two classes 
and as you can see the trees build a nice decision surface um, when there is four classes again they're able to split the points in a very nice way and then the next figure shows you what happens as you add noise when that is when the classes tend to overlap more in this spiral in the middle those points are very the yellow ones are very nicely separated from the green ones and the red ones and so on the right hand side is more like the kind of data you usually get in real life where there is noise and the classes overlap but even there with noise uh, trees give you, uh, random forests give you a pretty good solution um, the next parameter we examine is tree depth how and this kind of goes back to the question where to stop in the tree so um, if you build a tree that is very shallow um, as we do here for d equal 3 so the depth of three levels you might have what uh, we call underfitting so the decision boundaries tend to be very sort of harsh very coarse um, if you on the other hand build the trees that are very deep then you start doing overfitting because you start coming up with these decision boundaries and start going and paying attention to too much detail at the boundary like for example like here it's the decision boundary is going like this to, to basically to grab those red points is putting a little bit of red there so it's becoming very fine and we know what the problem with that is if you pay if you're if you have data that looks like this and if you start making a decision boundary that looks goes and does this uh, something like this then when you get test data it's not likely that that curve was going to be a good separator of the test data as opposed to something of lower complexity uh, for example something like this okay so it's again it's the question of complexity control how weakly should our function be going through the points how do we answer the question of complexity control in this case cross validation you would do cross validation to choose the number um, the depth of the tree but now we start having a lot of features we have the depth of the tree we have how many features we should sample at random um, how many data points we should bag when in the bootstrapping procedure um, uh, you know what's the maximum of points that we consider di dimensions um, should we use information gain or variance um, you know very quickly we're getting all these choices that we have to deal with how could you automate these choices Bayesian optimization thank you the technique you learned last week you could apply it on top of the tree all these choices are just random parameters of your algorithm so what you would do is you would use GPs and Bayesian optimization and you define a GP over all the choices that you're making you pick one parameter you evaluate how good the tree is in terms of cross-validation how the forest is in terms of cross-validation and that gives you the error for Bayesian optimization then you try a different set of parameters and you cross-validate again of course cross-validation is very expensive and building a forest is expensive so you want to do this as few iterations as possible and that's why you balance exploration and exploitation beautiful cost project for anyone who wants to do that um, the, this slide here shows what happens also if you so some folks in fact the Microsoft guys that uh, for the Connect, which include you know the, these guys of, that wrote this report um, they tend not to do much bagging that is they don't subsample the data so they sk skip that bootstrapping and uh, whether you do it um, depends on the following so here we have points of one class the yellow class so these points well so we have these points here which are class yellow and we have these points here that are class red um, here there's no bagging 
when there is no bagging and you apply a forest what you tend to find is that the forest finds the point the two points that are closest to each other of different classes okay what's the yellow point that is further to the right and what's the red point that is further to the left it then smack in the middle puts the decision boundary so that any point to the right of that black line or decision boundary also known as a discriminant would be classified as red and any point to the left would be classified as yellow this property here of trying to maximize the boundary between the two is called the max margin property okay. so random forest when there is no bagging is essentially a max margin classifier this distance here is called the margin there are other machine learning techniques known as support vector machines which are classifiers that they are also designed to purposely maximize this margin when you do bagging you find that whereas this decision boundary was over here now the decision boundary moved a bit to the left okay. why would it make sense to have that decision boundary moving to the left outliers precisely because there is this guy is a single guy who is very far from every all his friends and yet that guy is having a huge impact in the decision when you don't do bagging if that guy happened to be just a single point that someone mislabeled and your data often has a lot of mislabels because the people that you pay to label they're just trying to make some money on Amazon and <laughs> don't really care about your data and if that's the case then this might be the better choice in fact, bagging gives you uh, this immunity to outliers, at least as this example shows. All right, so I'm going to cut it here, but let me just give you a gist of what I'm going to do when, uh, when my student will go over um, after the break. He will basically tell you how to use, how to use very simple features to do, so you come up with very simple decisions. Like you take these very simple windows and you count how many pixels are in one of one class um, what's the intensity of the pixels in the black square what's minus the intensity of pixels in the white square and if that's just and you call that f and if f is above a number 0.2 you split the tree to the left and to the right if you have many very simple features again these simple features are like words a word by itself has no power in deciding whether something is spam or not spam like the word offers well many words have very little power and many of these simple decisions in vision using very simple features would have very little power but when you combine them into trees and when you average over these trees we end up with what you guys have in your consumer cameras some very good detectors and so you use these very simple features and in the end your classifier is going to be a result of many of these um, and you can do all sorts of detection not only faces but pedestrians, cars, hockey players, your kitties in YouTube and so on um, my student will also go over the Kinect which is the sensor that gives you these um, grayscale images and then he will show you how the Kinect can do the classification of all these um, I think I'm actually going to ask David to teach this David was actually an engineer at uh, EA for six years working uh, to a large extent on this, on this device, on the Kinect and he came to do grad school with me because he realized to do well in industry you need machine learning at least if you're working with this technology um, so he will go over this which is essentially random forest classifiers what they use uh, with very simple features um, and then finally um, one of the things that um, he will cover um, is that just like we do forest for classification you can use forest for regression again there would be a split point if, you, if this is your data you would use a split point 
you split the data into two nodes and then in each node you fit a linear model. Now you guys all know how to fit linear models so this would be just a combination of what you know and searching for among all those points for the best split. And that would allow you to build uh, very nice uh, classifiers and of course there's the frequentist and Bayesian ones and you know he'll go over all this in a lot more detail than I've gone through um, but I'm just trying to give you a gist so that you can think about projects as you go into this break. Um, one of the things you, you get when you do regression is if you have a data set that looks like this you might end up with a random forest fit as you increase the number of trees um, you will get say with uh, 400 trees you'll get these very nice decision boundaries and note note the following property where the data is there is no uncertainty or there is little uncertainty uh, I mean to say where there is no data on the other hand the uncertainty is large so it gives us what we wanted with Gaussian processes. Moreover, there are certain parts where there's multiple hypotheses at play. Is, would the point here be a continuation of the line that's going up, or would the point be a continuation of the other line? So there's two possible hypotheses, and that's why if you were to cut <coughs> that and look at it sideways, your distribution would actually be multimodal. No longer a single Gaussian, but in even though you're just fitting single Gaussians in each uh, line, you now end up with some very interesting confidence intervals that actually have, are multimodal. Um, project idea. Um, Bayesian optimization is done ad nauseum with Gaussian processes. Um, some people have used uh, frequentist trees um, to build, uh, base, to do Bayesian optimization. 